So welcome to our panel conversation on fast fashion, where we're going to be talking about how do we tackle overconsumption. While much of the current focus is on the net zero agenda at the moment, in order to truly end our contribution to the climate crisis, we really need to rethink how we consume in Scotland and around the world. We know that around four fifths of Scotland's footprint comes from the materials and products that we manufacture, use and throw away. This year, we revealed in our material flow account that the average Scot consumes 18.4 tonnes of materials every year. And that's equivalent to about 50 kilograms per week on average. We all know about the impact of the fashion and textiles industry. Not a month goes by without articles hitting the press. And while brands scrabble to position themselves in the sustainability agenda, we ask ourselves, is enough being done to stem the endless flow of clothing that passes through our system? The UK population purchases more clothing than most other European countries and throws away over 1 million tonnes of clothing every year. The fact that in 2019, it was expected that UK consumers would spend a staggering 2.7 billion pounds on 50 million throwaway outfits over the summer. is just one of the many facts that highlights the challenge that we face. So today we are welcoming brilliant minds and experts from a variety of fields to inspire uh, to discuss this issue and I'm really looking forward to provoking some thoughtful conversation on how we can inspire people, citizens, business leaders and decision makers to take action. So I'd like to introduce the panellists now. Michael Kusak is Head of Sustainability at ACS Clothing. He's worked for many blue chip companies in Europe, Asia and the Americas. Working with ACS over the last nine years, he, he has driven sustainability and organisational development, transform, transforming it into a total circular business. He's an engineering graduate with an MBA, an MSc and a master black belt from Motorola University. Dr. Kat Duffy is a senior lecturer in marketing at the University of Glasgow. She's researched consumer culture with a particular interest in sustainable clothing consumption throughout her career and has published this on the subject in a range of international journals, contributed to a range of publications, given invited talks, teaching and supervising PhD researchers in this area. And finally, Mary Lowe is a founding member and director for Sustainable Fashion Scotland, a community-led social enterprise exploring through practice how communities can contribute to collective impact and collaborate to create place-based sustainable transformations. She's a content marketer, systems practitioner, and has an MSc in social innovation. Focusing on sustainable fashion in Scotland, her research involves navigating complex challenges through a systems change perspective. She also wrote a short ebook as part of her undergraduate degree on how to encourage more sustainable consumer behaviour. So welcome to everyone and thanks so much for joining me today. Before we dive into the conversation, I'd like to ask you to introduce yourself with three interesting facts. So we're going to start with Kat because you're first on my screen. Oh no, in the hot seat. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you for the warm welcome, Anna. So turns out academics aren't that interested in trying to find three interesting facts. <laughs> it's difficult. Um, so first of all, I would say that I am really privileged that I get to research and teach something that I'm so passionate about in terms of clothing sustainability. Secondly, I'm a huge lover of vintage clothing, which means I'm always on the eternal search for an elusive 1960s Chanel suit. Thirdly, and just to provide some context for today, I'm currently seven months pregnant. So if I am breathless or anything, please don't take it personally. It is just that sitting and talking and general functioning <laughs> is becoming quite hard. Well, thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Michael, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm Michael. My background is actually manufacturing engineering. Uh, I graduated in the, 80, in the 80s when there was a large manufacturing presence in the country. And to dis my dismay, it's reduced over the years. I've, I was also at Motorola University, was the birthplace of a, you know, Six Sigma. And I was there at the start of that. Uh, I'm a black belt in it. 
I've got a lot of lean practitioner as well. But the other interesting fact about me is the fact that I've also got the learning and development angle as well. I, you know, so being a member of the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development, but I'm also a master practitioner in neurolinguistic programming. So there's a lot of the behavioral side as well. So I'm taking the process side and the people side. And the other thing as well is that in within a, a relatively short period of time, the company I currently work with, uh, ACS, we've managed to actually prove that we are actually a circular operation. We've proved we've actually been driving out 40% of our emissions over a relatively short period of time. And we're now a, a climate neutral certified company. And also taking the people dimension of sustainability, we're currently uh, pending our application for B Corp. So bringing it all together, uh, we're absolutely passionate about sustainability. It's our raison d'etre, it's everything that, that you know, that we, we exist for. Uh, and, and, you know, people who know us know the journey that we've taken and over the last three years from a small SME to a centre of expertise in sustainable fashion. So I'm really Thank looking you. forward to today. <laughs> I'll pass back. Thanks, Michael. That's great. Mary. Hi, I'm Mary. Uh, thanks for the, again, the warm welcome and introduction. My, my first two facts are very non-work related. Just oh, great. <laughs> my first is I'm a roller skater. That was a lockdown hobby I picked up. My second is I started pole dancing during lockdown as well. <laughs> so um, yeah, I had a bit of a hobby identity crisis stuck in my flat. So I do all the sports now. Um, and my third one is that I actually quite dislike the word consumer, but I'm sure we'll get into that later with my question as well. So really interesting <laughs> it's a bit like I don't like the word sustainable because I think it's overused so brilliant thanks very much and uh, thanks again to everybody that was really interesting so we're just going to go straight into the questions and um I wanted just to start um with Kat around um the role of research um, but obviously, uh, Michael and I feel free to, to also contribute to this question because I think it's really interesting. So Kat, would you like to really talk a little bit about how can the role of um, research assist us in understanding and shifting consumer behaviour? And how can we ensure that these findings are translated to scalable action on the ground? So I think it's a really good question to start with, and I'm really interested to hear from Mary and Michael about their perspectives. I think research really helps us to have an evidence-informed perspective on what consumers actually do beyond what they say they do or they think they do. And I think in-depth consumer research is really needed to understand the complexities of consumer behaviour. I think especially when it comes to clothing, which is so emotive, it's so learned, it's habitual, it's really deeply rooted in the social. We're not rational in how we approach our clothing. And I think it's only really through in-depth research that we can start to tease out and develop some of the nuances of those behaviours. From some of the research that myself and my colleague Deirdre Shaw have been doing around clothing, we found that clothing is such an incredible source of anxiety for consumers and that we all have our different kind of coping strategies in terms of how we approach that from feelings that we're drowning in stuff, um, people that hoard clothes, the eternal pressures that we feel to consume more, which social media really fuels, but also consumers that want to do better in terms of recycling and modifying their consumption but that people can feel overwhelmed, disillusioned, unsure of what information to trust. And I think that's where research is so important because it can help us to think about how we reach consumers, how we message consumers, but also where some of these structural barriers are in terms of how can we create action pathways that are actually useful and actionable for consumers. And that's where I think research has a really pertinent role to play. I think as an academic, I'm really passionate about research not staying in academic journal papers or in policy, and it actually has to translate into action. And I think that's something that's so important currently, especially when it comes to climate emergency, 
that we translate those findings into actual action. Great, thanks very much, Kat. Do, do Michael or Mary want to come in with anything on that topic of the role of research and how we can use it to, to inform our decision making? Um, yeah, I just wanted to agree with Kat mainly and add a little bit, but I liked how you said about um, like it's evidence-based and I think that's really important. A lot of the research we do, we talk about it being data-driven. So I never used the word data before because for me that was numbers and that sort of thing, but actually people's lived experiences is also data. Um, and I think using that approach helps to involve multiple stakeholders who are all working in the area. So like you said, it makes it easier to turn into action and it supports um, those people working in that area while the research is ongoing um, because for the climate crisis, you know, we can't wait to do the research and then have the findings and then yeah. implement the recommendations. So yeah, I think uh, action research is really important. We've looked at the EarthLogic action research plan by Kate Fletcher and Matilda Tam quite a lot to, to apply to our work. So I think that's a really good starting point for anyone wanting to do action research and fashion to make sure it does have impact today I guess and as you're progressing with the research. And Michael how have you used research at ACS to inform you know how you've developed your business? Well we've used it to at varying levels it's not just about consumers it's also about brands and retailers uh, who have a different mission I you know they have to they're looking at profit they're, they're looking at the relationship with the consumer. Uh, and then you've got the consumer as well and understanding, you know, the complexities there. We know it's an emotional purchase. We know that clothes can make us feel really good, but we also know it's an economic decision as well. Uh, you know, so there are a lot of a varying levels of that. We need more research. Uh, we, we have our own research. The other thing as well I would say is that, you know, we're doing a lot of work right now with young people and trying to educate them on, you know, in terms of, you know, sustainable fashion and the options that are out there. And I think research into that demographic would help greatly as well. You know, how can we bring them on board so that when they start in earnest uh, to procure uh, either the use or reuse of garments, uh, that they're suitably educated. So that would help as well. Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting point. I've got a question about, about that later because I think there's definitely uh, an awareness issue in terms of that knowledge gap or that behaviour gap between, you know, um, awareness of the climate emergency and how, how that translates to purchasing behaviour. Um, and just actually leads us really nicely into the second question, um, Michael. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about the work that you're doing with brands and retailers, and we know that the rental and resale market is, is predicted to grow significantly over the coming years. We've seen that reported, um, in, you know, by people like Farfetch. Some of the research though, is suggesting that uptake of rental models is still not widespread across the consumer base. So given your experience of working with retailers and brands to date, how do you think they can encourage those consumers who still prefer to buy new to consider a, an alternative way to accessing and owning clothing? Again, I would, I would raise the, the point about a, there's a different, there is a different agenda there. There is a worry with brands and retailers that they're going to cannibalise their existing market. And that, you know, they might find it more difficult to hold on to selling garments uh, if they move across to rental. It might confuse the brand message that they're putting out. Now, what we are doing is we're making them aware of what we can offer. So we're, what we're doing is we're saying, you know, in terms of sustainability, you know, th this is a circular business model. This is how it exists. This is the impact it can have in terms of the planet. This is also the financial case. Now, one of the things that we did was that we partnered with an organisation called Castle uh, because in the front end, we want to encourage brands. We want to encourage retailers to come on board. We want to make that journey. We are aspiring for a plug and play solution so that there's no barriers there. There's no excuses. Uh, we try and make it easier. So right now is this perception. It's difficult. 
Uh, is it really what the consumers are looking for? Well, yeah, but what we need to do is work in partnership to create awareness of it, create awareness of how good all these different, not just the rental model, not just the renewal, but other sustainable fashion models as well, and how, you know, that embracing these can actually, one, help you drive additional revenue, especially right now with the impact in the market with COVID. I, and, you know, with this additionality, there's so much more value because you're starting to develop a long-term relationship with the consumer. And that there's a lot of value in that. You know, when, with that long-term relationship, you understand there'll be a clever software, cleverer than me, that can actually build that relationship, that can actually look at what they like to wear, the sizes, the different types of brands with different sizes, how you can actually complement them, how you can move on to how you can wear your hair. So it becomes a whole, there's a totality of it that makes you feel really, really good, makes you additional value that could be added. Uh, right down to handbags, jewellery, all the accessories. So it's all there so that it could get bigger and bigger. So from that perspective, there's, you know, we're working closely with them. We're making them aware of that. We're partnering wherever we can with different organisations. We're reaching out. We're inviting people on. We're continually innovating. But the thing about it is uh, with sustainability, the closer you get to net zero, the more difficult. It's three times as hard with every step you make. And I mean, you know, we're doing wondrous things like rainwater harvesting, but it's still not zero water that we're using. We're still using water, using that. We're reusing water as well. The energy, we've got a wind turbine coming on site. We're going to, we've got a solar roof. Yeah, working with Zero Waste Scotland, we've managed to get these things. So these are really important things, but it's, the journey is very difficult. So, you know, the, what we are trying to get out there is getting this image of sustainability maybe not the word sustainability, looking at different things, but we're also looking at other aspects of it as well. We've, we've lost Michael temporarily. Kat, um, I'm just really interested. I mean, Michael picked up on, on sort of the digital side of things, and I know that you've done some research into how to use digital tools to encourage consumers to think differently about, the, about their wardrobe. How do you see the role of, of digitization really playing into this, this kind of change in consumer behavior? So I think that's a really important question. Um, I think to echo some of Michael's points about one of the things I really, um, in total admiration of ACS is the really holistic approach to circularity and sustainability. And I think that's the way that we have to see industry policy and practice transition. In terms of digitization, I think there's huge opportunities in terms of firstly reducing the volume of new physical clothing. And I think digital has a role to play in that in terms of digital wardrobes and a digital inventory. Um, obviously, that still comes with an, an impact, so we do have to be mindful of that. Um, as you mentioned, Dana, we've done some research through an ongoing collaboration with a startup app company called Save Your Wardrobe which aimed at digitalizing your wardrobe so that essentially if you can understand what you own, you feel more empowered to make decisions around what you're going to introduce into your wardrobe. You have data that underpins how many times you've worn something um, and there you can really understand cost per wear. Some of our participants referred to it as almost a Fitbit for clothing. And I think in essence that digitalization provides people with data, with information that they really want to have into their own behaviors so that they can make different choices. And I think that's where the opportunity of innovation is really right, that clothing as compared to food, for example, is a different industry. Consumers don't know what information to trust. They don't understand their own behaviors enough. And I think digital can be a really useful tool or solution in that space to help people overcome some of their obstacles in an everyday sense. Thanks, Kat. I think that's really relevant. My, I mean, you, you're kind of working from a grassroots um, level. What is your views on the rules of these alternative business models in driving down that consumption of clothing? 
I think alternative business models are, we, we definitely need them. I'm not sure what they all are right now, um, but that's an exciting challenge to imagine what these are. And, you know, I, I think some of them maybe don't exist yet, which again is an exciting opportunity. Um, but yeah, I think that like what Kat said there about ACS, just the holistic approach is so important. That's what I do all about systems that we need multiple solutions so we don't just need one new business model we need lots of them and we need them working at different levels we need small brands we need bigger companies we need all the other solutions as well but business models currently contribute a lot to you know the negative impacts with fast fashion so it's a definitely a key area that we need to probably put more time and money and research into as well yeah, I, I mean, I think what we were trying to pick up with Michael before um, we lost him off, off the panel was that um, I think what I'm interested to, to understand from the panel is, is the views on how how widespread we can kind of make some of these these alternative uh, ways of, of owning and procuring clothing. So whether that's the resale or rental, how can we make those a more palatable option for, you know, all um, areas of society, not just the people that are the informed individuals. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, I'm really interested in that, like how we can make it, you said, more palatable um, and accessible, I think is the biggest issue there. So I think you mentioned my undergrad, I, I wrote a my research turned it into an ebook about recommendations to encourage more sustainable consumer behavior. And it was quite marketing focused. And the top buyers were price, then awareness slash understanding, and then accessibility slash convenience. And since that was a few years ago now, since I've progressed in my work and research, I've added some new perspectives or, or taken new meanings from those, but they still apply. So I think the third one, accessibility and convenience is so important. And consumers do have power um, but, you know, consumers only have access to what is available to them. And currently the majority of that is fast fashion, whether that's on the high street or online. So, and again, they're not aware of maybe the alternatives that exist. So there's a few different things there. We need more alternatives. We need to make them more easily accessible in terms of price, but also just can they walk out their door and, you know, access it within five minutes, but also so they know that those actually exist. So. Yeah, there's a lot of factors there conflicting yeah. together, but that's yeah. really, really important and making that equitable for everyone to get involved. Yeah. I think that's really relevant is that accessibility, affordability, convenience. I mean, I, we've seen that coming through the, the consumer research that I've done, that you've done, that I'm sure that Kat's done as well. It's a, it's a combination of factors to really bring that to the high street or to mainstream these solutions and to, to make them something which which you know citizens or consumers you know, want to actually try in comparison to buying the you know the two pound t-shirt from Primark or you know whatever item it is. Michael, welcome back. Sorry we lost you briefly there. I think what we're going to do is quite nicely leads on to um, the final kind of directed question, um, which was um, actually to yourself, my um, and we've kind of we've covered a little bit of this already, but you know, often there's a degree of finger pointing where brand, whereby brands will argue that they're meeting a consumer need and consumers will argue that brands need to be doing more. And we've seen how consumers can really shift in their preferences with the whole single use plastic movement, which is now huge. So how can we use community-led action to harness consumer power in the same way and achieve change from the ground up? Thanks. I think that's a very complex question, but <laughs> <laughs> My apologies. Feel yeah, free okay. to break it down or just uh, answer what you can. Thanks. I, I have a few points um, that are coming to me. So firstly, I thought I should address when I said I don't like the word consumer, you kind of touched it there too. So I think that the word consumer does kind of reinforce the idea that fashion is just about buying and selling new garments in particular. And it kind of limits the action that we, you know, people could take. So I prefer citizen, which you said there. Um, and as we know, language is very important when we think of greenwashing and marketing. So I'm trying to slip citizen in wherever I can rather than consumer as well. Um, I think talking about community led action, obviously that's why SFS was started. We try and make sure our actions are influenced 
by what the community are saying, whether that's directly to us or from our research, what we've kind of analysed and gathered from what's going on in the landscape. So one big point there is what do we actually mean by community and how are we defining that, which was a whole chapter in my dissertation, but I'll briefly summarise. So in our work, we engage with multiple stakeholders and the, the way we kind of say they're part of that community is that they all share a vision of a sustainable, equitable and thriving future about fashion. They might have different individual goals within that, kind of like how Michael said, you know, brands do need money. That's a fact. We can't deny that. But overall, if they are genuinely wanting to contribute to this bigger change, they're part of that community. So that can involve individual citizens or consumers, but also local makers and designers, as well as bigger industry and then government and policy makers too. And lots of other people that I've probably missed out in there, but um, yeah, there's a lot. So when we talk about community-led action, we're talking about collaborative, collective action that is taken by anybody that genuinely shares that same vision. Um, and I think that is really important because as we all know, there's not just one solution for sustainable futures. So we really do need everyone working together, working on multiple solutions you know, harmoniously all at once um, that invite and include lots of different perspectives from like marginalised voices and communities, as well as the people that currently have power and money to, to put into that. So, yeah, I think when we're talking about community, um, a big important part of that is, as I said, including marginalised voices and making it as easy as possible for everybody to get involved. Um, yeah, and making sure that individual people have roles that are not just buying so we're working on that <laughs> Pat, michael do you have anything to kind of add into that that last question about that bottom-up real consumer shift and how do we how do we capitalize on on that consumer power to to affect change i, I mean what i would say is i i like the the term citizen i the term that comes to mind for me is about using the user uh, rather than consumer. Consumer is about consumption. We're using, you don't need to consume everything. What you're doing is that you're actually using it. It can be reused many, mm. many times. So I would say switching the, the power of language, which we've said throughout, is very important. Uh, in terms of usership, I would say to you that uh, there are so many ways that we can prolong the life of garments, that we can remodel garments, uh, that we can share garments, whether it be rental, whether it be going to a secondhand clothes shop. There's so much we can do. There's so much we can do about uh, the next generation and, and ourselves, you know, from the point of view of repairing garments and prolonging the life, you know, teaching these skills. And, and using the term life skills in terms of repair and upcycling. I have made, I have made a, an incredible journey over the last three years. I am so far away from what you would classify as a fashionista. It's absolutely incredible. It would hurt your head if you would believe the journey. But I've learned so much and I've met so many very passionate, interesting people, experts in this area, you know, and even on the panel, Everybody I know in the panel, and we, we intersect so many times. It's absolutely incredible. So the future, I actually think, is really good. And I think the future is really important in Scotland as well, because all these people are in Scotland and they're doing so much good work. We just need a bit of support from government. We need a bit of support from other organisations as well. We need the retailers and the brands on board, because the bulk of fashion is ch channeled through them. I, and I think, if, you know, influencing them, giving them models and providing them the support will make a massive difference. And at the same time, targeting, educating you know, the consumer, making them aware of the, one, the damage that fast fashion can do, but also the goodness that sustainable fashion can do. And can I just put in a wee pitch? We need to get, get eliminate VAT from sustainable fashion. We really need to do that. Let's level the, the playing field. Let's give consumers, because they are price conscious, let's give them a decision to make. Let's, you know, say, do you want the sustainable fashion? And at the same time, it's not that much more expensive or it's almost the same at cost. And you can save the planet as well. And you can get all these wondrous 
things in terms of variety of fashion, you can develop your relationship with them. I'll, I'll stop at that point. Thank you, Michael. Just a, just an interesting aside to that before we we start to kind of um, get to the final question and close off for today is I wanted to pick up on something that you just said, Michael, about that environmental impact and that awareness. And, um, you know, I was interested, although not surprised, to pick up on um, a fact from a recent report that's just been released um, which showed that one in five said that environmental impact does not influence their purchases in relation to fashion. And a further 34% have a low inclination to consider su such impacts. So I'm just really interested to hear from the panel. You know, we've talked about overconsumption, but there's also this, this disconnect between uh, climate awareness and, and that, you know, that purchasing behavior. And how do we change the hearts and minds of consumers? and strengthen this link between purchasing behaviours and, and climate awareness, um, which seems to be missing uh, for, for clothing, but it's very much there for things like plastics. I can start if you want. I just had two quick points. I think one that Michael has mentioned already and is really important is well, education, but with young people, um, because we know that younger people are more like a, like a sponge you know the, they're more open to new ideas I guess so and and they do care you know whenever you teach young people about the climate they are really interested and in, you know if we can get that kind of at a young age they'll grow up with that mindset and hopefully that will then affect their behavior has a better chance than we are now at least so I think there is research that supports that um, and then on the other hand like you said there's one in five people I think it was that don't really care um I'm not, I was going to say that's a shame, but at least four and five do, I think if that's the general assumption, you know, there, there's always going to be some people, I guess, that perhaps you don't even have the, the time or capacity to consider that. I think that's something that is important to remember. Not every consumer or person has the time to do in-depth research, you know, and figure out the options, which is why it's really important that brands and government take their, you know, that responsibility to make sure that sustainable alternatives are accessible and are convenient for those people as well. Um, I, I had a friend, I was in her garden and a neighbour came down and just dumped a whole duvet like in the bin because he just couldn't, didn't want it. But, you know, if he had a text or recycling bin in his back garden, that would help. You know, you'd like to think he would at least do that <laughs> if nothing else. So I think that's a, an important thing to consider as well. Thanks, Mary. Kat, Michael, do you have anything to add to, to what Mary said? I, I think I would probably just echo earlier comments. One thing I think around the kind of consumer empowerment is I'm always really cautious of over responsibilizing the consumer, that the consumer is quite limited in terms of the action pathways that they can take. As Mary mentions, if there's infrastructure with regards to making recycling accessible, but also going beyond that, the if circularity is something that is understandable and is accessible for all, there is going to be more of an uptake on it. But I am really hesitant that it seems like it keeps coming back to the consumer to do all the work, whereas they need to be supported by brands, policy, industry to make this accessible and to find ways that we can reduce and modify our consumption. And I think education is really important in that, but to go beyond education, awareness and intention, there needs to be these clear pathways to action and that has to come from government policy um, and from brands initiatives where they are, don't want to say encouraged, strongly encouraged slash forced to make different choices. And I think I'm still disheartened to see that the government, as we saw in 2019 rejected the recommendations that came from the Fixing Fashion report, where we can look at areas like end producer responsibility, we can look at putting different infrastructures in place to make this more accessible. I think we have to see these areas working in tandem together to support this movement moving forward. Yeah, absolutely agree. I mean, we've not really we've not really picked up on that whole reproduction piece in, to, in today's discussion, but I think you're absolutely right that there needs to be that top-down approach to, to stemming that flow and to really tackling that, that massive challenge of, 
of overproduction in the industry, which which seems to be systemic and and really quite unique to to the fashion industry because it's not something you would see in other manufacturing uh, sectors where overproduction would be seen as a, with inherent inefficiency. So absolutely, I think there is definitely a need to tackle that and to understand how we can regulate effectively to to really stem that flow from the production level. Michael, did you want to? Um... I, I, I don't find the, the stats surprising. Uh, what I would say is they're improving. I, what I would say is that it's not just, I totally agree with Kat and Mary, it's not just about the consumer, it's about us all. Yes, it's about legislation. Legislation will change big business attitude to fashion. I, but we also have to embrace, you know, because they have an important role to play in the economy. I, consumers, I just think we need to educate people, make them more aware. Now, we can do the shock horror stuff about poisonous rivers, slave labour, lakes drying up, but that the information's already out there. I, and I don't think, you know, people are getting hit with a lot of these stats all the time. We need to focus more on the positive side and about the goodness that we can do and the value in what we're doing and educating people through it. I do think, you know, in terms of retail and brands, there's a lot more work that needs to be done. And companies like myself persuading them I, and everybody around it persuading them, look, there is value in this. You can make it, it complement your original business models. Let's move away from this ownership thing in the UK towards usership. I mean, it's already happening, you know, in terms of things like so the way that we listen to our music, the way that we, you know, Airbnb, all that, you know, this, this sharing economy exists. Let's take it another level. Let's take it to close, you know, and, and I think it's we will get there. It's already happening in America. It's already happening in China. It's, these are massive markets for things like rental uh, and renewal. Uh, and I think it can be in the UK. And we just have to keep plugging away with it and keep the faith and trying and make this happen. Uh, and as I say, there are some very, very bright, enthusiastic, entrepreneurial people out there that will make it happen. And we just need to support them. Thanks, Michael. Um, I just want to finish off with, with a, a final question to each of you. Um, what is your top message to COP26 leaders what do you want them to do next? I'll start with Kat. Um, I mean, my wish list would be, it would be quite long in terms of what the legacy of COP should be and could be. To keep it succinct, I think I would be asking for support in terms of a society-wide transformation and education that needs to be supported through legislation to enable consumers to make these more informed choices that we've been talking about today. One of the areas that I think is potentially a huge growth area is in mending and care so that we can keep goods circulating for longer. Um, and I'd be keen to see that supported through local and national initiatives. Thanks, Kat. Mary. Thanks. I wrote four, but they're really short, so if I can, <laughs> they're like, <laughs> if that's okay. Um, first, I just, at, from this discussion, so I'd say, please that's make okay. it as easy as possible for everybody to get involved. So invite diverse perspectives, consider, you know, what um, barriers certain people have, which might be why you're not hearing from them and make it easy for them to get involved. Secondly, with COP and beyond, every action you take, just think, are you prioritizing planet and the people over profit? Just keep that mantra in your head every day when you wake up. <laughs> um, thirdly, please think radically. We need to transform, not tweak the existing systems. So just make space for that and be open to new ideas, even if they sound a bit scary or impossible. And finally, please apply systems perspectives. So think holistically. And if you want to find out more about what that means, feel free to get in touch. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mary. And Michael, just to finish off, very, very simple. Eliminate VAT from sustainable fashion and do it now because it'll level the playing field and it'll help encourage people to move towards sustainable fashion. 
Thanks very much, Michael. That's great. Um, thanks to you all um, for joining me today. That's been a really fascinating discussion uh, around the topic. And um, I hope that you know we will see some action on the ground um, post-COP and into the future. Thank you.